I study the universe um, and uh, in particular uh, the search for life, black holes, uh, how did the universe start and how it will end. Aha, uh -huh. and are we alone? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, my sense is that we're not special in any way. Uh, primitive life must be very ubiquitous because it started on Earth as soon as the Earth cooled uh, to roughly uh, room temperature. And uh, therefore, uh, there are many planets out there. We found that about a quarter of all the stars have habitable planets similar to the Earth around them. And so it's very likely that primitive life exists out there. With respect to intelligent life, uh, the uncertainty is much larger because we don't fully understand how we got here. And um, the argument you just gave says there's a lot of space, a lot of planets, uh, but if we don't know the probability of the origin of life, how can you multiply those two things together and then be confident that it's large? I, uh, I, I use the principle uh, of mediocrity. Basically, I don't think we're special in any sense. In the history of astronomy, you find examples where uh, many instances where people thought that we're special, that we are at the center of the universe, uh, that the sun moves around the, uh, the earth, uh, we figured that out, we realized that we are not uh, at the center of the universe. In fact, uh, we move around the sun, the sun moves around the galaxy, the galaxy moves within the cosmos, and there is no center. Uh, however, many people still tend to believe that we are at the center of the biological universe. And I fully sympathize with that because when I look at my young daughters, one is 11 years old and the other one is 15, uh, when they were very young, uh, they thought that they're at the center of the universe uh, and everything goes around them. And as they matured, they realized that there are other humans out there and they're not really at the center. And so our civilization has matured in terms of the physical universe. We realize that we are not at the center of that, but in terms of the living universe, uh, we haven't yet matured. Uh, my personal belief is that if we find ourselves here, there must be many more out there. The question is, how to establish contact wait, wait, and that, how to that, find let, it. Let me, you said your personal belief is that since we're here, there's going to be other, many more. Now, that means that you don't think that there's anything special about the biology on Earth or the type of life we have here on Earth? Yeah, I think that if something is realized uh, close to you, then it should happen elsewhere as well. Uh, and uh, it's hard for me to believe that we are extremely unique and special. Uh, when I see a person that looks Chinese, I, I can imagine there are many more Chinese out there. Uh, and um, I, I know that it's a natural tendency for us to believe that we are really special and that we are unique and that there is nothing like us anywhere else. But I don't hold that view out of modesty. So I would call it cosmic modesty. How about English? English, you think there's English speaking aliens out there? Um, not sure. Maybe out of cosmic yeah. modesty, you could say we there should be other people speaking English because it's well, then it's a question of probability of uh, whether they uh, are exactly the same as we are. But in terms of living creatures, uh, I would say that it's quite likely that it's out there. We have to find it, and it's not easy because the signals that uh, we produce as living organisms are negligible compared to the energy scales that we can detect at great distances. I, I once estimated on the back of an envelope how far away would we see a nuclear explosion, a nuclear war on a planet. It turns out that not very far. You, you, need, you need it to happen within the solar system. You can't really see it even next to the nearest star. So uh, the signals that uh, civilizations produce ordinarily are not very strong. Of course, if they're very advanced, then in principle you can see the signal all the way through the entire universe. But you were doing hydrogen bombs, not antimatter bombs. <laughs> yeah. But you can imagine our civilization is contemplating now uh, sending tiny spacecrafts to the nearest star that weigh roughly a gram using a laser to push on a sail. It's called uh, the Starshot Initiative and I'm uh, the chair of the advisory committee for this project. And one can imagine other civilizations working on such a project for a billion years by now and mastering this technology to a level that allows us to see the laser from the edge of the universe uh, as it sweeps across the sky. So, so in principle, you can imagine signal that you can, signals that you can see very far away, but they require very advanced technologies. But uh, Earth is rather young compared to all the other Earth, rocky planets in the universe. 
by a, maybe a mil, billion or maybe even two billion. And uh, where are all the postage stamps from all the other civilizations? What's your favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Well, I do think that uh, once we explore things, uh, we will find um, potential evidence. It's just not easy to find it because the energy scales involved are not large. Uh, but for example, we can look for artifacts. We can look for solar cells on the surfaces of planets that we find around other stars. And one way to look for it is we know that there is a red edge to the reflection of plants on Earth. Uh, in other words, plants don't use uh, photons that have too low of an energy, that are not useful for photosynthesis, and therefore they reflect them. And so when we look at the Earth from a distance, you see a, an edge, a spectral edge. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happens with solar cells, artificial cells that are used to absorb sunlight. They often have an edge, a spectral edge. So you can search for that. You can search for city lights that are also rather subtle. You can search for industrial pollution in the atmospheres of planets. I've written papers uh, on all of these topics. Um, and so I think we're still at the infancy of our search. And we might find evidence for civilizations. Of course, if they're very advanced, it should be more easy. Now, you may ask, why haven't we seen them? Well, there are several possible explanations. First of all, when we search, we often think about a planet next to a star. Uh, it's possible that, that that's a very short-lived episode in the evolution of a technological civilization that soon after they developed the technology to leave their planet, they leave their planet. And so we will not find them by looking near the lamppost. Uh, by the lamppost, I mean the star that hosted them to start with. They might be farther away or moving through space, and that's more challenging for us to find. But what uh, type of free energy would they tap into if they're not doing the photons? Of well, so there is um, friction with the interstellar medium. There, there are other energy sources that one can use. But if you ask why haven't they uh, signaled to us that they are out there, we might not be significant enough. Uh, sort of like ants on a pavement. So if you walk down a pavement, you don't pay attention to the ants. And um, it's not at all clear to me, once again, that we are worthy of their attention. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the question, are we alone, what do you, what do you interpret the we to mean? Our civilization, uh, intelligent beings here on Earth. Not we, the life forms in general on Earth. No. I think we are special in the sense that, uh, in difference from uh, primitive life, we are able to change the reality that we are born into. We designed airplanes so that we can go above the surface. We uh, mimic birds in a way, uh, but beyond that we designed spacecrafts that take us out of the gravitational pull of the Earth. Uh, that's quite remarkable if you think about it, because we can actually uh, go beyond the constraints that nature put us in. In particular, the gravitational potential well of the Earth. Um, we are able to escape from that. We will be able, maybe in the distant future, to escape from the potential well of the Sun, from the potential well of the galaxy. And that's quite remarkable. We are basically citizens of the universe rather than we, the local environment. We and all our microbes and viruses. We can carry them with us, uh, sort of like parasites, but um, it's actually the human mind that uh, is the most fascinating thing, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, when you go looking for life, what are you looking for? Do you have an operational defi definition of life? Yeah, so... Um, Life as we know it is uh, the thing we are looking for because our imagination is not developed enough. We don't fully understand how life on Earth formed. And so the simplest thing to do is say, okay, let's look for life as we know it, as we find on Earth, elsewhere. And it's, this helps a lot because um, it uh, also defines the kind of signatures you're looking for. So, for example, in the atmospheres of planets, uh, you might look for molecular oxygen that uh, without life on Earth would have disappeared within a million years from the atmosphere of the Earth, uh, together with uh, molecules like methane, reducing molecules that appear as a result of life on Earth. Uh, and so for an astronomer, um, this defines a very clear program. One should use uh, spectroscopy to search for the signatures of molecules that are indicative of life, like oxygen, methane, and others, in the atmospheres of exoplanets. And one can do that 
as the planets go in front of their star and some fraction of the starlight goes through the planet's atmosphere. So you can actually analyze that light and figure out, look for the fingerprints of these molecules. So volcanoes are not alive, even though they can produce out of equilibrium chemistry in the atmosphere and photochemistry can produce out of equilibrium chemistry, you wouldn't consider them to be alive? No. Uh, out of equilibrium is not enough. You need to find traces, biosignatures, things that would be indicative of life as we know it that otherwise you wouldn't find. Hmm. Okay. And uh, let's see, is the question, are we alone, an important question? It's the most important question in science, in my view, because it will change our view of reality in all possible ways. Uh, it, will, it could change the religious beliefs of some people. It could change... Um, it's the ultimate interdisciplinary field because it could affect uh, politics, it could affect uh, the way we conceive of us uh, in the universe, um, our place in the universe. Uh, it could affect, it, it could lead to uh, developments of um, interdisciplinary fields that currently do not exist. For example, astro-linguistics. You could think about trying to figure out how to communicate with other civilizations. It um, would affect um, uh, economics because you would think immediately about the possible implications for collaboration with other civilizations. Um, by the way, if we find another civilization, we, we should think about what questions to ask because it could be a shortcut that will save us a lot of time. Uh, it would feel like cheating in an exam where you ask another civilization what is the dark matter, what is the dark energy, because we are supposed to figure it out through observations. But they, they, they may have had the billions of years to do it before us. Um, I actually think the most interesting question is not only whether there is life around us in the Milky Way galaxy, but also when did life start in the universe? How early? Um, did it start with the first stars or the second generation of stars, about uh, 50 million years after the Big Bang, or much later, let's say a billion years after the Big Bang? Uh, and then how long will it survive? Clearly the Sun will die within 7 billion years, um, so stars like the Sun are not good places to support life in the long term. However, dwarf stars that, that weigh roughly a tenth of the mass of the Sun, uh, can last for about 10 trillion years, a thousand times longer than the Sun. So in the very distant future, dwarf stars, uh, which happen to be the most common type of stars in the galaxy, uh, will potentially support life um, up to 10 trillion years from now, a thousand times longer than the present age of the universe. And actually the nearest star to us is Proxima Centauri, 12% of the mass of the Sun, it's one of these stars that will last very long. And I, I very often advise uh, wealthy friends to buy real estate uh, on, on the habitable planet that was found next to Proxima Centauri. Uh, because in the long term, the value of this real estate will only go up uh, when our civilization would like to move away from... Who do from they the buy it from? <laughs> Who do they pay? Why, why do you have to... Astronomers. <laughs> Um, Stephen Hawking said that we should keep our heads down, that we should not broadcast our existence for, because, I guess, of the history of humanity and advanced civilizations uh, conquering and destroying and wiping out less advanced civilizations. Do you agree with that sentiment? Uh, we should be cautious. Um, it depends on how optimistic one is about um, uh, the nature of, of living intelligent beings out there. Um, um, if you look at the history of humans, it's true that um, often um, technologies were used uh, for uh, wars. Uh, and, uh, but however, they were also used for peaceful purposes. And so if you want to avoid risk, you might, be, you might prefer to be silent. The problem is we have been broadcasting for uh, 70 years by now, and uh, uh, these, these signals went out to 70 light years by now. So there is a sphere out to which we indicated our 
presence already. Uh, if someone out there sees us and detects uh, all the TV and radio signals we sent 50, 70 years ago, uh, they might decide to do something about it. Um, and it will take them a while. Uh, it will not happen immediately because the distances are so vast. So it takes light uh, 50 to 70 years to go there. Uh, it would take them probably much longer than a century to reach us because I cannot imagine they have a relativistic spacecraft. And so um, for the next century, we, we can live peacefully. But uh, beyond that, we should worry about it. Now, you, uh, you mentioned earlier about the prospect of what it would be like to contact these advanced aliens. And in the movie Contact, they are examples of, of what, how civilization, how people would react. Now, I know that when, when I talk to Australian Aborigines, for example, they, they do not necessarily want to hear about how, when their ancestors came to Australia and how they fit into the larger picture of the evolution of, and spread of humans around the planet. Often, when we have modern scientific views of Genesis trying to replace more traditional views, the whole culture and self-identity falls apart and you get lot killing and, and alcoholism and all kinds of problems. Uh, so don't you think that that was probably the most likely scenario for humans when we find out how, I don't know, how meaningless we are compared to the aliens who know everything? <laughs> Wouldn't we just, just uh, fall apart and say we're just terrible, we're not as important as we think we are, therefore why should we go on living or, and then we'll all get drunk or something? Well, I, I hold exactly the opposite view, perhaps because of my uh, own uh, way of thinking. So bring uh, it on, bring it on, yeah, give me some more knowledge. The more knowledge and information I have, the more powerful I, I think I get. Uh, because, Even if it undermines your self-image. Yes, I would like to know the truth, uh, because uh, then you can contemplate how to uh, move uh, forward in the best way. Uh, you, you know, you can in principle bury your head in the sand and just ignore things that occur around you um, or avoid the truth. Uh, it wouldn't change the truth, it would just mean that, that you are unrealistic. Uh, I prefer to be as realistic as possible, to know the truth, even if it's uh, not convenient. Yeah, but if you're in a classroom, I guess when you're in a classroom you are probably one of the best students in the classroom, but imagine there's also the worst student, and so you're going to be the worst student forever and ever and ever, and you probably get demotivated from trying to learn more because in the field of knowledge you come last and you're stupid and your your brain is only this big rather than this big. Well, it's not a one-dimensional, uh, uh, reality is not just one-dimensional, there are many qualities that someone can have and so even if we are we feel inferior in terms of some aspects of our development there might be other aspects where we we might be superior and so you always have to look at things positively and and, <laughs> and uh, enjoy the benefits that you have uh, even if there are people or or things better than you are out there so Carl Sagan said that we are the way the universe is becoming self-conscious do you think uh, that's true, or do you, would you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, as long as we don't know about other beings that are <laughs> self-conscious, because we might actually be conscious of a small part of reality, and there might be much more to it. And we will discover that not through our own uh, search, uh, because that would take us a billion years, as it took them, let's say, uh, but we might find that out after communicating with them. Do you think the more you know about your place in the universe that makes you a better person? Yes. I do think that people that look down and not up often are self-centered and uh, they, well, first they miss an important part of, of reality, which is how huge the universe and how diverse it is. Um, but second, they are not modest. They are often not modest. Uh, you know, if you look at kings or emperors that conquer the small piece of land on earth, and by small, I mean a small fraction of the surface of the Earth. It could have been big, as, I mean, as far as they could see. Uh, they became extremely arrogant, and they thought of them, they built statues of themselves. Like Yertle the Turtle. Um, but if, if you showed them a, an image from a satellite of the Earth, mm -hmm. or uh, a, an image of the cosmic microwave background, how big the universe is, and told them, look, what you did is just conquer this piece of land, this fraction of the Earth, and the Earth is one planet out of 10 to the power of 20 planets within the observable volume of the universe. So there are more planets in the observable volume of the universe than grains of sand on all the beaches on Earth. So this, this emperor would look just like an ant that hugs a, a grain of sand 
and gets extremely arrogant. But if you look at the entire beach, you think of this ant as uh, quite, you know, uh, entertaining because um, uh, it's completely unjustified. So, so to me, uh, the universe teaches us modesty, okay? And, and that's a great virtue, actually, when you come to think about it. When you see the big picture, you cannot think too highly about yourself. Even though, in looking for other intelligent civilizations, you are essentially projecting human civilization onto the universe. Yeah, just because we can't do better than that. Uh, the, the point is, um, nature is more imaginative than we are, and I've seen it many times over. Uh, you know, when scientists think they know the answer before they observe the universe, uh, they often find themselves wrong when they test it because the universe ha has more richness to it than we can imagine. But given those limitations, uh, you know, we should use the knowledge we have based on what we see on Earth and search for life as we know it. And that's, that's what we do. What part of your research is relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Um, a lot of my research, um, I've written papers on uh, potential signatures for both primitive life and intelligent life. For example, how to, first of all, we know that there is a planet orbiting the nearest star, Proxima, that is in the habitable zone. It's about 20 times closer to that star than the Earth is from the Sun, and the star is very dim. It's a dwarf star, uh, but it is within the habitable zone. We would like to know whether there is life there. Uh, and if there is life, what color is the planet? Is it blue? Does it have oceans? Is it green? Does it have vegetation? So the first step in that direction is to figure out whether it has an atmosphere. We don't know. Um, and so we wrote a paper with a, a, a postdoc here uh, showing that the James Webb Space Telescope within a, a couple of years should be able to tell us if there is an atmosphere. And Wait, that's just so basically... Direct imaging rather than transit? No. Uh, it's a very simple method. Uh, not direct imaging, not transit. Uh, the idea is that if you have... Uh, bare rock, uh, let's say, uh, associated with this planet. Um, this planet is tidally locked. There is a permanent day side and a permanent night side uh, mm -hmm. because it's so close to the host star. And so there is one side that is hot and the other side that is cold. And as it moves around, you see different phases of mm -hmm. that, just like you see phases of the moon. Mm -hmm. um, now, the temperature contrast between the day side and the night side depends on whether there is an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. A bare rock would have the maximum contrast in temperature, and atmosphere will moderate the temperature contrast. And the same is true with oceans. And so one can calculate what should be the temperature contrast for bare rock, mm -hmm. and then compare it to data from the James Webb Space Telescope. As the planet moves around, it takes it 11.2 days, that's mm -hmm. the duration of a year, uh -huh. Uh, and if there are living uh, creatures there, they celebrate a birthday every 11 days, which is a great thing, you know. Um, so as it moves around, you are seeing um, uh, the color of the planet changes. The temperature is modulated on 11 days. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you just do photometry of this planet as it moves around and so figure out the temperature contrast. So you have to do coronar coronography in order to block out the, the light of the host star. Uh, you can, in principle, yes, you have to... Uh, see the modulated part, the okay. part yeah. on top of the star, you need to see extra modulation, and that would correspond to the planet. Some people are looking for biological life on the surfaces of planets, and other people think, you know what, biological life only lasts a little bit, and what happens is you get advanced life, and then they are no longer biological, therefore they don't need to be on the surface of a planet, so we should be looking for these life forms, advanced life forms everywhere, not just on surfaces of planets. That, uh, that is true. The question is, where to look, uh, and it's not an easy question. Um, so for example, another paper that I wrote was uh, searching for artificial lights. And the idea there was if there is um, an object that produces its own light, then it gets dimmer as it moves away from you, like one over the distance squared. But if the object receives its light, let's say, from the sun that illuminates it, mm -hmm. uh, then the uh, radiation that it uh, reflects mm -hmm. uh, gets dimmer as it moves away. So you have less uh, radiation so coming from the, the source. Mm -hmm. So it falls off as actually one of a distance to the fourth mm -hmm. uh, in that case. And what one can do is in principle search for objects that move uh, within the solar system and see if they uh, 
produce their own light or not. Right. And uh, it turns out that a city like Tokyo, we did the calculation, can in principle be observed throughout the solar system um, with existing telescopes. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And what kind of aliens would you like to find? Those that uh, communicate. Those that communicate. So are you looking for God? Um, looking for no. omniscient beings who've lived so long that they know all the answers to astronomical, astronomical questions? Yeah, I'm looking for uh, more information, for answers to some of the questions we haven't solved yet. Um, and also uh, learning. Uh, and if they are very advanced, they may have learned things. Uh, they have, may have learned new laws of physics we haven't figured out yet. Uh, they may have learned about new means of communication. And that could uh, save us billions of years, in a way, uh, in advancing us to the next level. Or kill us. That's also possible. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, what, uh, now, Yuri Milner gave $100 million to help improve the sensitivity for the SETI searches. Do you think that was a good idea? I think it's an excellent idea. And if I gave you $100 billion, $100 billion with the caveat, you have to spend it to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? Um, I would uh, have to think about it, but uh, there is remote sensing, uh, as we're doing now, basically looking for signals. Um, uh, and there are all kinds of uh, artificial signals that one can look for. So first would be, the first task would be to brainstorm through all possible signals that we could detect with such an investment of funds. The idea would be to develop instruments that will have much more sensitivity than we currently have. And of course that would be a boon to uh, astro astrophysics because the same instruments as they look at the sky would find other phenomena that are natural in origin. But uh, it would basically uh, lift uh, the sensitivity to the point where we can detect very weak signals that currently we can't detect. And as I was saying before, currently we can only see very advanced civilizations uh, if we have an investment in hardware that improves our sensitivity by orders of magnitude. We would be able to detect much more mundane signals that, for example, we are producing uh, as a civilization without a special effort. Uh, and so the idea would be to um, think about the, te the, the detectors, the remote sensing uh, observatories that one can uh, construct with a huge investment of funds that currently we don't have uh, and improve the sensitivity in, in, in the direction of being able to detect signals that are much weaker. That's uh, one direction to take. Another one... half of your hundred billion? Uh, no. It, well, it, it depends. Uh, I, I, have to, I have to make a plan. It, it could be half, okay. But another major initiative, and, and Yuri Milner actually funds that as well at $100 million, is to design a spacecraft that would be able to travel uh, and uh, give us information that we cannot get by remote sensing. And so we all know that um, the biggest discoveries uh, geographically on Earth came from exploration. And so just by sitting in Europe and using a big telescope, you won't be able to learn about what's going on in other parts of the Earth. You have to go there. And um, uh, therefore, we need to leave our solar system and visit places. Uh, and uh, that would be one of my uh, important investments in developing the technologies that allow us to uh, get probes elsewhere to possibly in the very distant future, take our civilization elsewhere uh, and uh, spread ourselves so that we reduce the risk of being uh, eradicated due to some catastrophe here on Earth. You know, in the long term, that's really what we should be concerned about, the longevity of our species, of our knowledge, of our technology. And, and I, th I would definitely invest a significant portion of that, in, of, the, of that $100 billion fund in developing technologies that allow us to transfer ourselves elsewhere. I asked a, an Indian student this question, and he said he would invest it in poverty reduction programs. And the reason he said that is that if you want to detect aliens, you have to stay alive, and he thinks that with poverty and in economic inequality, we, we as a species will not stay alive. What do you think of that? No, I think it's a very noble goal um, to... Um, but do you think it's practical? I mean, the, the idea is important that you have assumed that you're gonna, we're going to be alive and then we're going to do this and this and this. But he didn't want to assume that we're going to be alive. He wanted to ensure that we're alive so we can 
to something? I think uh, the biggest risk that we face is in the long term. Uh, there are many catastrophes that can happen, including the change in the climate. Um, ultimately, it's the sun that will die. And we must think uh, forward. We must think uh, about how, you know, on a much grander scale than improving the living conditions of people on Earth right now, how do we guarantee that uh, everything we develop does not disappear? Uh, that we have uh, some long-term um, survival in the cosmos. Okay, and uh, you wouldn't spend any of this money for getting microscopes to look for nano-aliens that might be no. inside this room? No. no. Okay, <laughs> all right. Um, let's see. What about the idea of a multiverse? Do you think uh, if we're alone in our universe and there are aliens in another universe that we would call ourselves alone? No, I think if they exist outside of our horizon, that would be great and we will not be alone. But, but uh, the point is that we will never be able to find out uh, because the horizon defines the distance out to which we can actually gather information about. So um, <clears throat> it goes in, in the realm of uh, philosophy as to whether things exist that we cannot observe. I mean, if we can't uh, observe and verify, mm -hmm. then I would prefer not to waste time thinking about it. Okay, now Lawrence Krauss said that we are a cosmic accident. And I'm wondering what he meant by that. I think, was he talking about a Higgs field freezing out in a different way or some kind of symmetry breaking in the early universe? What do you think? Well, I think there were many um, steps that led to our existence that uh, occurred and may, you know, under other circumstances would not have taken place. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, that's true also of my personal life. Uh, the reason I'm here at Harvard, this, the chair of the astronomy department, uh, depended on many steps along the way that could have turned otherwise. Okay, And I'm obviously grateful that it ended this way, and it could have ended other ways, and it's an accident in one way or another. But uh, accidents take place, and there is nothing um, special about it. Uh, you know, you just have to accept the fact that um, out of modesty, that there is nothing uh, very deep in your existence, that, that in fact, you know, we are not special. I think that we are not alone. And, um, you know, the fact that we, our existence came as a result of accidents doesn't mean much either. Well, do you think there were accidents so fundamental, things like, uh, like the Higgs field or something, freezing out in a different way and you'd have, I don't know, a different, or a different lambda, for yeah, example? Yeah, then we wouldn't exist, so what? But, but are those possibilities, does science suggest that those possibilities really exist, or are we just playing mathematical game? No, so when we look at the standard model of physics, uh, there are some fundamental constants uh, that are measured, but we don't know where they came from, and you can imagine that in other regions of the cosmos, they obtain different values. It all depends on how, what is the underlying physics responsible for these particular constants. But will uh, your imagination be motivated by science or just imagining? No, so my, my personal view is that these are all speculations, that in fact uh, the, the notion of, of the multiverse um, is a bit uh, risky because we can't test it and, and the progress of science was based on tests against experiments. And so I'm, in that sense, more conservative than many of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we should stick to the method that proved effective at uh, allowing us to, to learn more, which is comparing our ideas to experiments. And that's because we, we, our imagination is not good enough. Mm -hmm. And so nobody would have predicted quantum mechanics. And even after experimentalists uh, discovered quantum mechanics, Einstein had a hard time accepting some of the basic mm -hmm. uh, premise of, of, of quantum mechanics. So um, I would say that, you know, again, out of modesty, we should be guided by experiments. And when it, we should not address questions where ex experiments are excluded from guiding us. Okay. Do we live in a simulation? I don't think so. As far as I know, I, I kissed my, my wife this morning and uh, it's very real to me. It's very real to you. So <laughs> even if she was simulated, if it's real to you, that's good enough, huh? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, are we alone? Uh, no, I think we are not alone. And why? Because I don't think we are special. <laughs>